All right, we are live. Hey there, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with another live video chat for the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. Now, if you just tuned in a minute ago, we probably had a little technical difficulty. I had to restart the video chat there. So hopefully you are able to uh, see this one right now and it's coming through loud and clear. Test, test, test. If this is coming through, can you let me know in the video chat window there if you can hear me? Okay, Jesse says it's coming through loud and clear. Awesome. Okay, now there were some questions posted earlier when I set this up, and I still have those saved here on my end. So hopefully I'm not going to miss any here. Uh, Ross is joining us. Steve, Peter, Abram, Alec, awesome. First Revenge, Chris. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, let's just see. Some questions were there, so I'm going to go through those. And if you have anything that you would like to discuss, please feel free to post your questions, comments, topics of discussion in our video chat window, and I'll do my best to help you out over the course of the next hour. All right, so let's see if this is coming through here. Good stuff, good stuff. <clears throat> All right, seems to be working fine on my end. Now, one thing you may have noticed if you've been following along with uh, my Facebook page, with the, uh, the emails that I've been sending out, we are in the process of starting another Lose Your Gut Challenge. And it just, it's not officially kicked off. The official kickoff is tomorrow morning. But we've got 160 guys in there now who are ready to go. And over the next five days, I'm going to be taking them through a proven action plan to map out a strategy, and especially when it comes to nutrition, of how they can master their metabolism, lose the gut, and optimize their nutrition so that you can basically overcome the, the, the crap of all the yo-yo dieting and the starvation diets and all that crap that people get caught up in. You know, I want to kind of simplify the process and help you to lay out realistic action plan. So we're in the process now of kicking that off. Uh, the, the challenge, again, welcomed everybody into the private group. It is officially closed off. So if you're in the challenge, congrats. You know, it's, it's awesome to have you here. I'm looking forward to coaching you and helping you over the next five days. If you didn't get a chance to join in, sorry, the doors are officially closed. No more people will be entered in. But we'll probably do another challenge, um, you know, maybe maybe in December or maybe in the new year. But the fish, this challenge is officially closed right now. So we've got 160 guys lined up, ready to go. And I'm super pumped, super excited. Uh, last time when we did the five-day Lose Your Gut Challenge, we had like 120 people. So we even got more in this one. So it's, uh, it's going to be good. I like to say, this is where I really over deliver and basically try and do everything in my power now over the next five days to help you motivate you educate you and give you the tools you're going to need to succeed when it comes to mastering your metabolism losing that gut and not only that but how you can keep it off over the long term so i'm super excited about that and uh, i know we probably have several people who are tuned in right now who are going to be partaking in that five day lose your gut challenge and it is an active challenge right i'll just give you a heads up here now for those of you who are part of it it's not something that you're just going to sit on the sidelines and passively watch right if, if that's what what you plan to do just kind of like sit in the shadows like hopefully nobody notices me i'm just going to lurk and, and see what it's all about you're going to be kicked out of the challenge because every single day there are going to be accountability yeah i'm getting tongue tied accountability tasks that you need to complete and failure to complete those tasks will re result in you getting booted out of the challenge. So this is an interactive challenge. It's not something that you just sit and passively watch. And to kind of give you an analogy, it, if, if you just watch something, like you, you're watching YouTube videos all the time, you're probably you know following fitness influencers on social media, you've probably read numerous books and articles and whatever about fitness nutrition, and, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but it doesn't create change. The only way to create change is to actively participate, to do stuff. Action is the only thing that creates change. Watching, learning, you know, filling your mind with more information, that doesn't do anything. You actually have to do it. 
So, like, for example, if you wanted to learn how to swim, are you going to go on YouTube and watch videos of people swimming? Are you going to go and read blog posts about swimming? Or are you going to read books about swimming? No, you're going to get in the water and learn how to swim. And that's the purpose of the five-day challenge. It's like getting in the water. I'm going to have people actively doing things over the course of the next five days so that they can start developing these habits, implement, learn by doing, and take this, take the bull by the horns and actually get some real world results. So that's the purpose of it. It's not just something you're going to passively watch and, oh, hopefully I'll learn a couple tips, but I'm not going to do anything because learning without implementing is useless. So I'm super pumped, super excited about it. And that's going to be a, one heck of a week. Like I say, we had a, a great uh, challenge when I did it a couple months ago. And this one, I hope to, uh, over deliver again, take it over the top and, you know, have it even more interactive, deliver more quality, learn from my mistakes that I'd made the last time around and make it better than ever. So I'm super pumped about, about that. All right. We've got a lot of people tuned in live. Steve, Jesse, Chris, Doc, Isaac, Wayward, Woodworker, uh, uh, Wasif, Frederick. Awesome, guys. Nice to have you all tuned in. Glad this is coming through loud and clear. All right. Steve is saying, do you charge for making diet plans? Yes, I do. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sure whatever you do for a living, you probably charge for that as well. So yes, I do. And if you would like some help with that, send me an email, lee at leeh.com, and we can discuss it. Because I don't just have like a, a you know, one size fits all cookie cutter approach. When I help somebody with a personalized training and nutrition program, it is tailored for the individual, right? So, I mean, if, if you just need a little bit of help, that's fine. If you want a full on coaching program and help and have me actually follow through and guide you every step of the way, that's available too. But uh, again, if you would like some information about that, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to chat with you. And we'll come up with a realistic action plan that's right for you. We have young Buddha joining us. He's asking about freezer cooking. I don't know how you cook in the freezer, but he says this freezer cooking is when you take a day to cook an entire week or month's worth of food, and then you freeze it all, and then you just heat up the meals every day. It saves time and on cooking. What are your thoughts? If you enjoy that, go for it. I mean, I, I usually prepare meals, you know, like not, not that far in advance. Like I don't make a month's worth of food and, and store it in the freezer, even though there's nothing wrong with doing it. But I usually, I like to cook on a daily basis myself, right? That's just me personally. Uh, but I sometimes we'll have some of the, the basics that I'll have on hand for, for leftovers for future meals. Um, but I, I usually don't partake in the whole stock in the freezer with pre-cooked food. I like to have food fresh that day, but just because it tastes better. I, I enjoy fresh, freshly cooked food. <laughs> and, and a lot of the stuff that I eat is not even cooked, like especially when it's fruits and vegetables and salads and, and fresh, you know, raw foods like that. I have that on a daily basis. I don't want to have that frozen by no means. But uh, whatever works for you, like if meal prep works and you find that's convenient, then by all means do it. I know a lot of people who, who do do the whole meal prep and have like a week's worth of food prepared in one go and, and they find that that's very convenient, then if that's the case, go for it. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with doing it. I know other people who like to take advantage of like meal prep services where they actually have their food delivered to them, already prepped, ready to go, and all they have to do is pop it in the microwave and eat it. That's another way to make it work. And bottom line, the, the easier you can make it for you so that you actually follow it, that's the plan you should follow. Like, the best diet is the one you follow, right? So if this helps you to follow a consistent meal plan, then by all means, do it. Do what works for you. We have Frederick joining us, and he's saying, what can you mix oatmeal with to get complete protein? You can actually put protein powder in your oatmeal. And if you would like, uh, I've put together a recipe showing you how to make high-protein oatmeal. And I'll tell you what, I'll even give you the link where you can go download that. It's a free recipe guide that I put together. Uh, let's see. Hi. I'm just going to get the link and I'm going to post it in our video chat window right now. Let's see. So this will be 
free high protein recipe guide. Boom. I just posted a link in the video window. So if you would like uh, the free recipe guide, go to that link and you can download it. Uh, that includes a high protein oatmeal recipe. Chris is joining us. He says, Lee, thanks for your pragmatic advice on training. I think sometimes we overthink these things, so I appreciate your no-nonsense no approach. Uh, he says, I had a question on why it's not a good to take in carbs during a workout. I'm referring to maybe eating a small apple or snack or if, if it does not upset your stomach. Eating during a workout. I, I personally, don't, I'm not a fan of eating during a workout. If I'm in the gym, I'm there to lift weights. I'm not there to eat. <laughs> And, and honestly, there, there's no point in eating during a workout. Like you, the food and, and the glycogen that you have stored in your body beforehand will fuel a workout. Uh, unless you're doing some ridiculous long marathon program that requires you to work out for hours on end, which I wouldn't recommend anyway, you don't need to eat during a workout. There's, you're not burning that many calories when you work out. Like people overestimate how many calories they burn working out, especially weight training. Like you'll burn maybe five to 10 calories per set. That's not a lot of calories. So like if, if you're doing 20 sets, you know, you're burning like, like max 200 calories, right? Like that's not a lot. That's not a lot of calories, right? Like seriously, that's not much. And so you you have more than enough calories in your system right now to work out. Like you have the stored glycogen, you've got stored body fat. You mean you can you don't need to eat while you're in the gym, right? You, I just drink water, stay hydrated, but you can eat before you go to the gym, like usually like an hour or more before, and then eat after your workouts. That's fine. You don't need to be eating during the workout. In fact, I, I think that would. It, I mean, what what happens is if you're eating food, you're that food is taking energy to digest, you know, energy that you could be using for actually working out. You know, it diverts blood and energy to digesting and breaking down the food. And if you're already working out, then you know, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. The only time I would recommend that again, is if you're doing some prolonged exercise session, like if, if let's say you're, you're gone hiking for the day, right? Like, you know, it's hours, you know, you're, you're hiking up a mountain <laughs> for hours on end. Yeah, you're going to eat during your hike, right? You're going to stop and have a lunch break or whatever. But um, for people who are just going into the gym, working out for an hour, no, you don't need to eat. Uh, another question here. Uh, okay, that's actually a follow-up question to the previous one. Chris is joining us. He says, I always eat a very good pre-workout meal, but fine if I have a small apple. Okay, this is a follow-up to the previous question. I always eat a good pre-workout meal, but fine if I have a small apple or a small amount of, of something during a weight training, it helps me power through and keeps my strength up. If it works for you, man, go for it. I mean, I'm not saying don't do it, but personally, I, I wouldn't recommend it, and I don't think it's necessary. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Ken is joining us. Where is it? I actually might, I just lost my place. Ken is here joining us from the UK and he's going to be part of the five day challenge. I'm looking forward to following along with your progress over the next five days. Ken, it is going to be an awesome experience. I'll tell you that right up front. It is going to be very informative, very insightful. And it's kind of going to be like, you know, we're going to open up your mind and really show you what's possible with without going to extremes, because a lot of people have this all or nothing mentality when it comes to losing fat, getting in shape. They think, you know, you have to be following some crazy strict, like low carbs, starvation diet. And that just sets you up for backfiring. All right. So I want to teach you a realistic, sustainable lifestyle approach, something that you can enjoy and follow for the rest of your life. Because if, if I tell you to go like, oh, eat nothing but boiled chicken and broccoli and, and work out two hours a day and, and do two hours of cardio. Yes. If you did that, you would lose weight. No doubt about it. You would get, you would lose fat. You, if you stuck with it long enough, you would get ripped. Absolutely. But nobody wants to live the rest of their life on boiled chicken and broccoli and working out six days a week for hours on end. Like it's not a realistic, maintainable approach. You have to find something that you enjoy and you can stick with. And that's going to be the key to long-term success. 
And that's the reason why so many people go on diets, lose weight, get frustrated, hit plateaus, and then binge and gain it all back again, right? This whole yo-yo dieting, it, it's, it's a vicious cycle. And 99% of people who go on diets end up yo-yo dieting, right? They'll lose a bunch of weight and then they get, they can't maintain this ridiculously strict regimen that they got themselves on and they end up binging and gaining it all back. You need to learn how to make it a lifestyle approach, something you actually enjoy and can follow through over the long term. Like slow and steady does win the fat loss race. Trying to lose weight as quickly as possible, like starve yourself and lose 30 pounds in 30 days, that's just setting yourself up for massive disappointment. I mean, even if you did do it, like let's just say you went on a ridiculous low carb starvation diet and you did lose 30 pounds in 30 days, you would feel like a bag of shit at the end of that 30 days and you would just be craving junk food. And as soon as your willpower runs out, guess what? You're going to give into those junk food cravings and binge and that 30 pounds that you lost, you would pile that back on and most likely even more, right? So you might lose 30 pounds in 30 days. And then over the next 30 days, you might put on 35 pounds and set yourself back even further. That's that's the, why yo-yo dieting never works. So we need to find a way to make it realistic and sustainable. And that's what we're going to be covering over the course of the five-day Lose Your Gut Challenge. Uh, let's... Da, 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 da. I got a question here, young Buddha saying, does it drive you crazy when people say, uh, Arnold says you only need six hours of sleep a night? <laughs> if that worked for Arnold, more power to him. But honestly, most people, I think, will function their best by getting adequate sleep. I'm a big fan of getting adequate sleep. Like for me, six hours is like the minimum. If, if I don't get six hours minimum, I don't function well. And i feel I function better the more sleep I get, right? Like seven, eight hours of good quality sleep makes a huge difference. If, if you're trying to work out in a sleep deprived state, it, it's, it's like burning the candles at both ends. Like sleep is so important. I know some people try and say, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead or, you know, what all this whole stupid crap. But you, you need sleep to optimize your, your recovery, optimize hormone production, I mean, everything functions on, on having a good night's sleep. I think that is a foundation. If you don't have that in place, then you're really shortchanging your progress over the long term. Uh, Wasif's got a question saying, what is a vacuum? Can anyone do it and what is it for? Uh, well, that, that could mean two things. First off, a vacuum is usually what you use for uh, cleaning your carpets. And uh, it, it's, <laughs> but I don't think that's the one you're referring to. A vacuum is basically a, a stomach vacuum, and all it is is basically sucking in your gut. For lack of a better word, it, it's sucking in your gut. Now, typically when people do a vacuum, they blow out all their air, and then they suck in their gut. Like, I'm, I'm not a... I can probably show you a vacuum. I'll try and do a vacuum. All right. So I, I blow out all my air, then you suck in your gut. So you suck it in. So, like, there's and then you relax. That's what a vacuum is, right? It, it, it's a pose that a lot of the old school bodybuilders did and a lot of the uh, the classic physique guys do. Uh, it, instead of doing the abdominal pose where you crunch and, and actually flex your abs, you basically just blow out all your air and try and suck in your stomach and create this, this vacuum where you're kind of like hollowing your stomach a, as much as possible. Now, it takes a lot of practice to do it. It's actually a very difficult pose, but it's good... It, it, it's good to practice that because it works the transverse abdominus muscles, the muscles that actually hold your stomach in. And most people have very weak uh, transverse abdominal muscles. And that's why, you know, as you get older, your belly sticks out. Like in some cases, even guys who are not really fat, they have a pot belly because the, they're so used to just letting their gut hang out that over years, it just becomes so weak that they don't have the muscles to hold their stomach in. And that's why they get the, the pot belly. Right. You see this a lot, especially as guys get older. So working on a vacuum and purposely practicing that throughout the day can keep those muscles strong. And the best time to do it is when your belly is empty. So before meals or whenever you're, you're on an empty stomach, it's a good time to practice it. Trying to do a vacuum with a full belly is kind of counterproductive because you've got all that food in your stomach. You're not going to be able to suck it in properly. So that's what it is. And, and that's what it's for. All right, another question here. This one's from 
Southern NH drums. It's a passive or active hang on a pull-up. I'm not exactly what you're referring to there. Passive or active hang on a pull-up. I mean, hanging from a pull-up bar is is a great stretch. I mean, I, I do it because it, it helps to, it's good for the shoulders. It helps to stretch out all the muscles of your lats, your your chest, your torso. helps to decompress the spine. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of, of stretching by simply hanging from the pull-up bar. And I usually do it at the end of every workout as part of my post-workout stretching routine. But I'm not exactly sure what you are referring to. If you want, you can uh, elaborate on your question for in the chats and... If I have time, I'll try and uh, answer it better. Uh, Frederick's asking, Lee, back in the bodybuilding days when you would work out every other day, what program were you, were you following? Was it push-pull legs? I've changed my workouts over the years so many times. I don't, I don't have just like this is the program I do when I do this program all the time. I would change it up constantly. And let me elaborate on that. Like, I wouldn't be haphazard about it, but I would constantly cycle my workouts. So I'd probably stick to a set plan for four to six weeks, and then I would change it up and do something else. And one of my favorites that I constantly find myself going back to is the positions of flexion style of training. And positions of flexion means that you work all your major muscle groups through a full range of motion. So you do exercises that work the mid-range, the fully stretched and the peak contraction. I've got YouTube video playlists showing positions of flexion workouts. So if you go to my main channel, just open up the playlist tab and you'll see, go through them, you'll see there's a positions of flexion workout. That's one that I'm a big fan of. I mean, push pull legs is great. You can actually incorporate positions of flexion with a push pull leg split. Total body workouts are great as well. You know, upper, lower body splits. Uh, sometimes I would follow like power lifting and strength training programs. But uh, I never had just like one plan that I did over and over again. I, I would cycle it and go through different styles of training. And not only does it keep the workouts fun and enjoyable, but it's, it's great for spurring on new muscle stimulation because each time you cycle and, and follow a different style of training, you tend to make better progress, right? Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, eventually your body's going to hit a plateau. Right? I've, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. Every workout you follow will go through a phase of adapt, grow, plateau. Adapt, grow, plateau. Every program. I, I don't care if it's push-pull legs, if it's total body, if it's a five-by-five, five, a powerlifting style training, whatever. The, the first phase, adapt. You do something unique that you're not used to. And different exercise, different program, different something. Your body has to adapt and get used to that new exercise or that new program. In the process of adapting, you're gonna grow. You're gonna spur on some new muscle growth. Eventually, that growth is gonna slow down. You're gonna hit a plateau. Once you've hit the plateau and you see that you're no longer making the same progress that you once were, or your strength gains uh, plateau, or some cases you'll actually start losing strength, which is quite common, your strength is gonna fluctuate. It just doesn't constantly go up linear, linearly. Your strength will go through phases, right? You know, you'll have spikes, ups and downs, ups and downs. But over the long term, we want to see it going up. Uh, but it, it's not going to go up nonstop forever, right? There's going to be peaks and valleys along the way. So once you realize that whatever it is you're doing is not working, you're in a plateau, that's a good sign that maybe it's time to change it up and do something else. And that's when you can implement a, a different style of training or different splits, different exercises, different set and rep pattern. There's so many ways that you can cycle your training. Uh, as part of the uh, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle, I actually provide a, a workout of the month program, with, which is a complementary program that has plans that you know complement the previous month's plan. So maybe like one month we did a bodybuilding hypertrophy program. Maybe in the next month, we're going to do more of a strength training program. Maybe the following month, we'll do more of a conditioning type of program and cycle through different uh, methodologies of training so that you get to experience these adapt, grow, plateau phases over and over and ultimately spur on new muscle growth each time you change up your program. Okay, where was that? Um, what's the best exercise for raising body temperature, winter is on its way. Warming up with cardio. I, I always do cardio warm-ups beforehand, but 
It's especially important in the wintertime when it's cold outside. You, you want to do 10 minutes uh, of cardio to get a light sweat worked up before you even hit the weight room floor. Like trying to do weight training when your body is cold is just an injury waiting to happen. So in my case, when I go into the gym, first thing I do, I mean, I'll put my stuff in the locker and then I just go to the cardio. And I, I like to do cardio that moves the total body. So very often I'll use the, uh, the rower machine. Uh, we have a Concept 2 rower at the Platinum Fitness that I train at. So I'm a big fan of that. If that's occupied, then I'll probably use like the elliptical with the moving handles. I like to do something that gets the upper and lower body engaged. Uh, if, if, by, if you don't have access to that, you could even just go for a light jog on the treadmill stationary bike step, or it really doesn't matter what you're doing. Just as long as you get your body warmed up, like do minimum five minutes and ideally 10 minutes to just get a light sweat worked up, get your heart rate elevated, you know, get your breathing elevated. Like you don't have to kill yourself. I don't expect you to like run sprints or anything like that, but just get your body warmed up. And then when you hit the weight room floor, go through some mobility exercises to limber up, especially the body parts you're going to train. So like if I'm training upper body, I'll do some arm circles, do some rotator cuff rotations. If I'm training lower body, I'll be doing some body weight squats and some hip rotations and things like that. Warm up the joints of the, exor the, the body parts that you're going to be training and then get into your actual weight training workout with progressively heavier warm-up sets for all exercises and, and really focus on injury prevention, right? Injury prevention is the key because, I mean, if, if you get injured, that's setting you back instantly, right? Like there's nothing that can set you back as fast as an injury. Like if, if you skip a workout, right, that's, that's really not setting you back in the greater scheme of things. Uh, if, if you train easy and you don't push yourself to your max, it's really not setting you back. But if you get injured, that definitely sets you back, right? I mean, an injury could, depending on the degree of the injury, might set you back a week, might set you back a month, might set you back a year. In some cases, you may never fully recover from it. Like I know guys who have serious injuries like uh one one guy I, I know blew out both patella tendons squatting too heavy right i mean and and that injury has haunted him for for over a decade now right i mean it's 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 a serious injury like he'll he'll never recover from it he'll always have knee trouble for the rest of his life because of that injury you know sometimes if people tear a pec you know you tear the muscles and the tendons and ligaments right that could be bothering you for the rest of your life so injury prevention is key, right? The most important thing you can do is prevent injuries. All right, Woodulos is joining us uh, from Scotland. He says, Lee, good evening from a chilly Scotland. He says, any plans to do some Wim Hof training this winter? Maybe. <laughs> I have to be totally honest. I have gotten a bit slack in the whole... Uh, Wim Hof training. This was something a couple of years ago. I really, I really took it to heart and, and did it. If, if you want, check out, I posted up a YouTube video, maybe it's probably a couple of years old now, but I, I haven't really been focusing on it lately. Um, but you know what? I might give it a go again this winter. It's, it's one, it's something that's going to make you tough. I'll tell you that, right? It makes you tough physically and mentally. And if you're not familiar with Wim Hof, just do a YouTube search, Google search, whatever. The guy's on another level. All right, Jesse's joining us. Uh, why do Smith machine exercises get such negative talk? I look on forums or videos on YouTube, and a lot of people say basically don't waste your time with the Smith machine. Don't follow what everybody says on social media and YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Like, I use the Smith machine for certain exercises. It's just another tool. Like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the Smith machine. It doesn't work for all exercises, uh, but it, it is a great it is a great tool. Like you can use it to help you in certain cases. Like I like to use it for teaching people how to squat because it forces you to keep your body upright and it actually prevents you from falling forward or backward. Uh, sometimes you know there are different exercises the Smith machine may be ideal for, uh, like lunges or something like that. If somebody has trouble with balance, you know, you can use it that way. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just another tool, right? You, of course, some people are not going to like it and some people got a big mouth and they're going to bitch and complain about everything. But 
like there would not be a Smith machine if, if there wasn't a use for it, right? And, and for those who say, oh, you can't make games using a, a Smith machine, that's a crock of BS. Prime example, uh, former Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, did not do barbell squats. He did Smith machine squats. He was a Mr. Olympia. Like, Mr. Olympia is like the, the best of the best of the best, right? Like, elite world-class dominated bodybuilding when he was competing and he used the smith machine so some jackass on, on social media who says oh the smith machine sucks well you know take it take it with a grain of salt sean is joining us and he says i have a meal before the gym and after the gym which contains all my calories for the day is this okay or should i fast after the workout for a bit i'm cutting with 1,200 calories a day max. First off, Sean, 1,200 calories a day. I mean, if, if you're 100 pounds, maybe, but that is extreme. Like, I'm gonna ask you this. Do you think you'll be able to live the rest of your life eating 1,200 calories a day? Probably not. That, my friend, is what I would refer to as extreme starvation dieting and it's only a short-term approach. That is setting you up for a big, bad binge slash rebound. That's setting yourself up for failure right there because it's not realistic. It's not maintainable. Um, personally, like in my case, I diet on like if I don't like to even use the word diet because it has such a negative association. But if I'm training for fat loss, and I want to lean out, I will reduce my calories to 2,500 per day, 2,500. And I find if I'm eating 2,500, that's enough of a, of a deficit for me to be tapping into stored body fat, but it's not so crazy that I feel deprived, that I lose muscle, that I, I get these uncontrollable food cravings, right? I, I, can, I can live on 2,500 calories a day and feel comfortable. 1,200, I would go insane. Like all I would be, I would be obsessed with food and I'd probably be able to stick with it for two, three weeks. And then I'd be like, look out. I just have to eat. I, I, you know, the hell with this ridiculous 1200 calorie diet. I have to eat because I would, it would just drive you insane. So honestly, my friend, you're setting yourself up for failure right off the bat with that whole 1200 calorie a day thing. I, I'm telling you right now, I'm, unless you're like some midget dwarf who's like a hundred pounds or less <laughs> and, and like 1200 is is actually a, a healthy calorie range for for such a small body weight but man for 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 a normal sized guy like if, if you're anywhere close to 200 pounds or more 1200 is starvation and again it's setting yourself up for 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 nasty old rebound and setting yourself up for failure like say if you would like some help with planning out a realistic diet send me an email and I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Again, my email is leeh at leehayward.com. Um, quite honestly, I, I'm probably going to be swamped this week because I'm in the process of running that whole lose your gut challenge. And that's going to be taking up the majority of my time because I give a hundred percent commitment to that. But uh, I'll, I'll still, if you send me an email, I'll try my best to get in touch with you and we can uh, have a chat. All right, Peter is joining us. Please recap instructions on percentage day challenge. Please recap instructions on percentage day challenge. Uh, unless you mean the five day lose your gut challenge. I'm not exactly sure. If, if you're referring to the lose your gut challenge, refer to the private Facebook group because that's where I'm going to be covering everything. Like tomorrow morning, the thing kicks off. Right now, today, it, the group just opened. Like literally an hour ago, I, I welcomed everybody into the group. and it's, So nothing has started yet. It kicks off tomorrow morning. So if you're part of the lose your gut challenge and you want instructions, 8 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow morning, I'm going to be going live on the Facebook page. This isn't live YouTube or none of this. This is just for the people who signed up for the five day lose your gut challenge. And I will be going into detail explaining what you need to do day by day. So follow the, the, the Facebook group for instructions on that. Uh, Ren, she is joining us. He says, what's the best brand, be, sorry, best band exercises to grow the forearms. I guess you mean rubber resistance bands. 
Uh, you could do reverse curls with rubber resistance bands. That's a good one to work the forearm extensors. You know, like it's literally reverse curls is just have your palms facing down and, and do your curls that way. Um, but gripping exercises, the most neglected thing for your forearms, like everybody thinks of, of wrist curls and stuff like that to build your forearms. And, and yes, you do work your forearms. Like when you do a curl, you work your forearm flexor. When you extend, you work your forearm extensors. But the best exercise for your grip is actual, or for your forearms, is actual gripping. When you grip, that works the entire forearm and it works it in a very functional manner. So exercises that strengthen your grip. I'm a huge fan of hand grippers. This is one of the best tools that you can use to build up your forearms because these grippers, I carry them on my website. If you want to go leehayward.com, you can scroll down the side menu bar, check it out. But these are in 50 pound increments. They start off at 100 pounds in tension, go all the way up to 350 pounds in tension. And you can train your grip in a progressive overload fashion, just like you would train you know, any exercise, but building up your grip strength is the single best thing you can do to uh, grow your forearms. It's, it's one of the most neglected things, but it will have a huge impact. And not only will it thicken up the forearms, but if your grip is stronger, you're going to feel more secure when you're lifting weights, when you're holding on to those barbells and dumbbells and machine handles and the pull-up bar and whatever you're doing. And the stronger your grip is, uh, the, the stronger you're going to feel. Like if, if your grip is is the weak link, it, it's going to impact you all over. Like, uh, uh, for example, if, if try to um, exercises with a sweaty grip, like let's just say your hands are really sweaty and clammy and you grab onto the barbell and you just don't have a good, solid, secure grip, you are not going to feel as strong as if you did have a good grip. And that's why people use like lifting chalk because it helps to uh, dry up sweat and it increases friction between your skin and the barbell. Just having that secure grip will make you feel so much stronger because you're eliminating that weak link of the grip. But of course, if you can actually strengthen your grip and have more, more gusto when you grab the barbells, dumbbells, and machine handles, then you, you'll find that your strength and, and all those exercises will improve as well. So focus on the grip if you want to build forearms. And I have a free um guide that actually covers this let me just find it for you and i'll post a link in our chat window I'm trying to I, i'm going to type in the link because i'm not 100 sure of the url i just all right there it is shit i love there you go all right i'm going to type this into our video chat window now Free forearm training guide. Boom. Just typed it into the video chat window. You can go download that. And after this is all posted up, I'll, I'll try and remember to po put links to this in the video description afterwards. So for those of you who are going to be catching the replay of this video chat afterwards, I'll, I'll try and post links to all this stuff down there afterwards. All right. Where was I? I lost my space now because I scrolled down to the bottom to type that the, that comment in. Um, we we're talking about grip. Where was it? Grip. Ah, shit. All right. Next question is from First Revenge. It says, Lee, is it true wearing a weightlifting belt on squats, deadlifts, etc., prevents development of the core? No, it does not prevent development of your core. You can still strengthen your core. However... Use the belt appropriately. Use it the way it was meant to be used. Use it on your heavy working sets, not all sets. So, for example, if you're doing squats, all your progressively heavier warm-up sets, don't use a belt. Just go through the natural movement without the, the belt. Once the weight starts to get heavy, then you can put the belt on. Same with the deadlifts, same with overhead presses or whatever. Use it for your top heavy sets. And... <laughs> Using a belt is even optional depending on what it is you're training for. Like right now in my own training, I'm not pushing myself hard with heavy weight anymore. I'm not powerlifting. I very rarely wear a belt anymore because I just don't need it. I'm not I'm not squatting limit weights or deadlifting limit weights. So it's I rarely wear a belt. But if I was doing a strength program, you know, like low reps, five reps or, or lower, I would definitely wear a weightlifting belt. But if I'm doing high reps, sets of 10 or something like that, I don't need a belt for that. 
and, and I don't wear a belt. So, like I say, you use it when you need it, and when you're doing heavy sets, that's when the belt can come into play. And it will make a difference. If, if you have that belt on and it's a good uh, proper powerlifting belt, it will help to give you that extra stabilization throughout the core and, and help you to lift heavier weight. And I've got videos on how to use a belt. So just go to YouTube, search for Lee Hayward weightlifting belt. And I've got a video explaining the best belts to get. I've got a video explaining how to use the belt because there, there's a right and a wrong way to use it. Like I say, a lot of people... Uh, use it incorrectly. So uh, watch those videos, and I'll go into more detail about it. They're older videos, but the information is still just as applicable today as it was, you know, 10 years ago or whenever it was that I made those videos. All right. Steve is joining us. He says, I'm a retired pro wheelchair basketball player. Uh, what what meets W O T? What meats can be reheated? All right, you're a retired wheelchair basketball player. What meats can be reheated? Um, I guess any meat can be reheated. Um, you, usually, all right, the, when it comes to reheating food, uh, chicken is one of the better ones if you're planning on like cooking something in bulk and reheating it later on. Like chicken, you... you Go is well. It goes well because it, it it actually can maintain its its moisture as long as you don't overcook it. I'm not a big fan of reheating steak or beef because when it's reheated in the microwave, it kind of goes really rubbery. Like if I'm eating steak, I like to have it fresh, like fresh off the grill, and it usually tastes the best. So if you're cooking food in bulk, um, chicken, fish, things like that tend to be better for leftovers. Meat. You know, your, your, your steak, red meat, could be bison, um, whatever you have available, beef, pork, stuff like that, tends to be best when it's uh, fresh. But really, you could reheat any type of meat. It's just it's not going to taste as good, usually reheated. All right. NK is joining us, saying, I'm currently dealing with a reoccurring chest strain. It's mild and pain, but reappears. Any advice? Yeah, I've got a video, just, what's the name of it now? If you do a search for Lee Hayward chest strain, you should find it. So let's go to YouTube. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. I'm just going to double check for you there now. Um... Pulled chest muscle, rehab exercises to speed recovery. So if you do a search of Lee Hayward, pulled chest muscle, you'll see that video. And it covers some good uh, tips that you can do to rehab that. All right, Pedro is joining us. He says, I went from 305 pounds to 292 in one week, just changing my eating habits. No exercise. Is this okay? If so, why? Also, my weight can fluctuate five to seven pounds. From going to bed and waking up. Great question. This is this is very helpful for people who are overweight and have a lot of weight to lose. First off, it, it's all a percentage. Like the bigger you are, the, the faster you're going to be able to lose weight. Like someone who's 300 pounds is going to be able to lose fat and weight faster than someone who is, let's just say, 150 pounds. Right? Assuming you, you need to lose weight at 150 pounds, right? But it, it's all due to percentage, right? Like at 300 pounds, you have way more weight, way more to lose. So you can lose it faster at that than you can for someone who's has less to lose. So yeah, in one week, just like if you just cut out the junk food, right? Easily, you could lose like 10 pounds or more in a week just from that alone. A lot of it's going to be water weight. A lot of it's going to be intestinal bloat and just excess like that water retention and gunk just getting out of your system. Uh, but it, it's very normal to lose weight very quickly at first. And again, most of it is just water and, and intestinal bloat. After you get past that initial hump, like after the first month of following a fat loss diet, you, you will lose weight quickly, usually the first month. And then it settles into that slower, like maybe one to two pounds per week. Now, someone who's 300 pounds, that range, you can easily lose maybe even two to three pounds per week. And, and do so healthily. But as you get leaner and the weight starts to come off, 
it's going to slow down to maybe one to two pounds per week and then even one pound per week and then maybe even like half pound per week. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's just, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the reason why your body weight fluctuates is due to water weight. Uh, I actually made a video about this just recently. Let me see if I can find that for you <laughs> on my YouTube channel. Um, where's, where's it to? What's it called? I'm just trying to think of it now. Go to, it's a video called why you should weigh yourself every day. So if you do a search for Lee Hayward, why you should weigh yourself every day, watch that video. And it's only a short one. It's only like a three minute video, but it explains why your weight fluctuates. And I also, I, I do a, a demonstration right on the video itself where I purposely lose two and a half pounds in two hours, literally two and a half hours, less two and a half pounds. And then within an hour after that, I regained it all back again. What did I do? I went for a bike ride. I went for a bike ride and I sweat out two and a half pounds of water weight. I ate my lunch after my bike ride, rehydrated and ate, and I put that weight back on again, right? Your weight's always going up and down based on food and water weight in your system. It's not stable. So if you eat five pounds of food, you'll gain five pounds of weight, right? You sleep overnight and, and you dehydrate yourself and that food gets digested and absorbed and you're going to lose it, right? So we're always going up and down and five pounds is normal. The heavier you are, the bigger the fluctuation. Like for someone who's 300 pounds, I'd say a 10 pound fluctuation over the course of 24 hours is very normal. And it's, it's, most people are not aware of it because they don't weigh themselves that often. But I, I do it just for, for shits and giggles. Like I'll get up in the morning, I'll weigh myself like midday, I'll weigh myself. And in the evening, I'll veer off and weigh myself and just see how my weight fluctuates. And, and it's a good habit to get into because it, it teaches you how your body reacts to different foods, to different exercises. Like if, if you go to the gym and work out, you could easily lose a couple pounds just just by working out you, you through the the sweat that you lose while you're working out and then of course when you have your post-workout meal and you rehydrate afterwards you're going to gain that weight back again so we're always in a constant fluctuation of, of body weight when we're trying to lose weight what you have to focus on is the average and, and that's what i go into in that video is how to get your average body weight and use that for measuring your progress because these fluctuations uh, can throw you off if, if you don't understand how your body weight works because like some people might weigh themselves one day and let's just say you weighed yourself first thing in the morning after you use the washroom and you're at your lightest weight and then next week you weigh yourself again but you weigh yourself later in the day after you've had a few meals and you've been drinking some some fluids and and you might be like five pounds heavier and you're thinking oh my god i gained five pounds this week no you didn't it's just your weight fluctuating because of food and water right so you need to learn how to get your average body weight and that's what I cover in that video. So again, just do a search for um, Lee Hayward, why you should weigh yourself every day. And you'll see that one. Ken is joining us and he says, Lee, I haven't been here in a while. Are you still cutting looking good? I'm not cutting, bulking, anything. I'm living a healthy, lean lifestyle. I'm not, I'm not dieting or anything like that. I'm just, I've set up myself up in a system where the way I eat helps me to stay lean and in, enjoy it long term, right? Like I'm not dieting. I'm not depriving myself or anything like that. In fact, right after this video chat, we're, we're going out to dinner and I'm going to enjoy myself at dinner, right? Like I don't, that, that's what I'm going to be covering basically in the five day ch challenge is how you can make this a lifestyle approach. Because once you say I'm, I'm cutting, I'm dieting, I'm whatever, like, it, it it screws with your mind because nobody likes the feeling of cutting or dieting. Like I understand for, for certain sports or whatever, it makes weight. It makes sense. Like you, you might have to cut weight if, if you're a, like an athlete trying to make a weight class or whatever. But for the average person who wants to have a lean, healthy physique and, and you're not trying to cut for a deadline, you just want to lose weight, feel good, get in shape. Get, your, get this, I'm going on a diet crap out of your head and just think, I'm a lean, healthy, active person and I'm eating a lean, healthy eating plan. Like, I'm not dieting. Because once you put that word in your head, first off, when people go on a diet, they think temporary. Like, nobody wants to go on a cutting diet for the rest of their life. Like, say, okay, you're, 
right? I'm 40 years old now. Let's let's hope I live to be 100. Okay, well, I'm going to be I'm going to be cutting for the next 60 years, guys. No, right? I eat a healthy, lean lifestyle diet, right? I, I'm not trying to go on a cut. And, and that's the biggest mistake that the average person who's trying to lose weight and get in shape makes is they they think of like all or nothing. Like I'm going to go on this extreme diet. Like one of the guys earlier said he's following a 1200 calorie a day diet. I'm like, man, you're just setting yourself up to, you're setting yourself up to fail. Seriously. Cause you cannot maintain 1200 calories a day. Like, you know, 120 pound woman would be hungry on a, on 1200 calories a day, let alone a full grown man. Like, yeah, you just, right. I, I, I that's what I'm, I'm trying to teach in the five day challenge, right? Because there's, there's so much to this, right? Like it's, it's not something that I can just cover in a, in a quick video or, or something like that. It's, there's so much to it, right? It's, but at the same time, like once you fully grasp it and realize how simple it is, like it, it, it's complicated until it's not, right? That's, if that makes sense. Like at first it's complicated because you have to change all these paradigm shifts that we've been brainwashed into thinking. But once you understand how it works in the greater scheme of things and, and you fully adapt it as, as a lifestyle approach, it's not hard. Like I'm not suffering to, to maintain a lean physique year round. Like I'm not shredded by no means, but I don't know. Like, you know I, I mean, I still got some visible abdominal definition. No, it's not shredded by any means, but I can see my abs. Like when I crunch, <laughs> there we go. The lighting's better here. I actually, but at the same time, I still have a bit of loose skin from the fat that I used to carry back in the day. But I'm happy like that. Like, if I can see some visible abdominal definition and I'm not dieting to do it, that's happy. Like, that, I'm content with that. Now, I'm not perfect. Like I said, I've got a little bit of loose skin in my lower abs, and that'll probably never go unless I get a tummy tuck or something. But that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, you don't have to cut to maintain a lean physique. You just have to change your habits. And once you have those habits in place, then it's easy to maintain. Anyway, let's move on, right? Sorry if I offended anybody with my belly shot there. <laughs> Pedro's joining us. He says, uh, I mean, is it okay to lose weight this way? And is it healthy to do so? Well, he was the one. I, I write, Yes, I did. It's, I already answered your question. He was the 300-pound guy. Yep, it's okay. What you're doing is okay. Uh, RC is joining us. I'm at work and I wouldn't miss this for anything. I'm old enough to know people like Lee are few and far in between. So all the 20, 35 year olds, listen up, solid advice. Thanks. I appreciate the feedback and I'm glad that you tune in. I mean, you do this every week at work. Awesome. You're, I appreciate the support. Alec is joining us. Um, what is one workout? Sorry, what one workout do you recommend for big arms fast? All right. The, the fast, like, fast is, is a relative word. Like, you, you, nobody can really build muscle fast, lose fat fast. I know we kind of use those terms and they're kind of loosely thrown around, but it takes time, right? Like, there's nothing you're going to do that this week and like next week you're going to be huge jacked the guns popping out of you right now it, it doesn't happen it takes you know years of training to build muscle but if you want a good solid training system i actually put one together and it's called blast your biceps and you can go check it out at blastyourbiceps.com um that's that's the program i'd recommend and it's a three-phase program, but the core of the program is based around the position to flexion style of training that I mentioned earlier in the video chat. Working the major muscles, in this case, specifically biceps and triceps, through mid-range, fully stretched, and peak contraction exercises. I found that is the best way to uh, to maximize muscle growth. And, of course, in the Blaster Biceps program, we prioritize the arms. So... It's called Blast Your Biceps, but it, it's really a full arm program. I mean, it prioritizes biceps and triceps. It's just Blast Your Biceps sounds cool with the alliteration. Um, so that's why it's called that. But it's it's really a complete arm specialization program where we'll put the other body parts on a maintenance phase while we prioritize the arms. And it, it's a good one. Most people who go through that program, I mean, you can realistically add a, an inch of, of solid muscle over the course of a couple months going through that. And, and in fact, 
one of my coaching students, I posted his progress pictures on Facebook just recently. If you're, if you're following the my private Facebook group, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook group, or you're friends with me on my personal profile, I, I shared his progress pictures. His name is Graham. He's 54 years old, started working with me two months ago, and in two months, he lost three inches off his waist and put two inches on his arms. And like he's just an like he's no elite athlete or bodybuilder or or anything like that. He's 54 years old, right? I mean, he's an average, you know, guy in his 50s. But he's been following the program. He's been super consistent from day one. You know, like right from the start, there was none of this him and Han. He just like whatever I told him to do, he did. Right? It's as simple as that. Right? So he, I said, okay, you got to join the gym. All right, he joined the gym. I said, all right, here's here's your program to follow. And he followed the program. I said, here's your meal plan. He followed the meal plan. All right. I said, all right, I want you to book a coaching call with me, you know, every couple of weeks so we can stay in touch. Right. And he booked these coaching calls. And I said, if you have any questions, email me. If he had questions, email me. Like he followed the plan to the T uh, like amazing. Right. I gave him instructions and he followed them. And the progress he made was incredible. Like say put two inches on his upper arms in two months and lost three inches off his belly. Right. So, I mean, like his chest, shoulders, arms are so much fuller. His waist is so much slimmer. Again, you can see his pictures. They're his. They're on my Facebook page, on my Facebook group, and stuff like that. Uh, super proud of them. I mean, again, it just shows the the progress that you can make if you follow a proven system and you commit to the process. So, in that case, I would say that's big arms fast. You know, two inches in two months, right? That's that's fast. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Brandon's asking, you should be at the gym right now. I was at the gym this morning. Got that done and over with, my friend. Chris is saying thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Doc is joining us. Doc Green. Lee, do you recommend eating five to six meals a day for someone over 50? Seems like a lot of food for the body to process and pass. This whole thing of meals per day, it, it's you need to look at the total volume of food. Whether it's five meals a day, six meals a day, three meals a day, whatever, it depends on the volume of those meals. Um, personally, I probably average four to five meals slash snacks per day. Like I like to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then something before bed. Sometimes I might have another snack in there between. Sometimes I won't. Like sometimes it might only be three meals. But don't get hung up on the meals per day focus on what it is you're actually eating and, and the volume over the course of the day. Like think bigger, think longer term. That's what matters. Like if, if your goal was fat loss, you want to average a slight calorie deficit and it doesn't have to be a big one. It's just a slight calorie deficit over the course of the long term. So whether you're eating three meals a day or you're spacing it out into six, as long as you average a deficit, you'll lose body fat. Now, with that being said, when it comes to fat loss, a lot of people find it easier to eat fewer meals rather than less food per meal. Because let's just say you're, you're like in my case, I eat 2,500 calories a day for fat loss. So if I were to eat five meals a day, that's 500 calories per meal. 500 calories per meal is not a lot, right? Like it's, and, and one of the drawbacks to eating small meals is sometimes you eat enough to spike your appetite and, you know, get, get the juices flowing. You stimulate your appetite and, and you just, you want to eat more and then you have to stop at 500 calories. So it can be very frustrating. It's like you had to leave the table still feeling hungry. Whereas if, you, and let's just say we ate three meals per day, but we had bigger meals. So just to throw out some numbers, we had three meals of... 750 calories. Well, you get a bit more eating satisfaction and you're still keeping the total calories the same. So I, I kind of opt towards that when I'm trying to uh, lose body fat. I'd rather have fewer, more satisfying meals than multiple small meals per day. Because I, I find if you go s s small meals, it, 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 like say, you're, you're eating enough to make yourself hungry and then you have to stop before you're satisfied, right? An analogy I like to use for that, it's almost like imagine getting yourself, uh, you know, you're, you're spending an evening with your lady friend, and you're getting, you're going through the foreplay process and you're getting yourself all aroused, but you had to stop before you're satisfied. 
Like that's no fun. Nobody likes to stop before they're satisfied. Same thing when you sit down to the table and eat. You start eating a little bit of food, get your appetite stimulated. And you're like, oh, this is good. This is good. No, I got to stop before I'm satisfied. Like that is frustrating. Whereas if you have fewer, bigger meals, then you can eat until you hit that satiation point where you like, you feel, yeah, no, I, I've, I've had a solid meal. I feel good, right? You can leave the table feeling comfortably full. That's a nice feeling. And if you can do that, uh, then you'll probably have better success with sticking to your meal plan over the long term. So uh, th that's that's what I kind of recommend when it comes to fat loss. But again, the, the, the meals per day, you can make both work. It's the totals that matters, not the amount, or sorry, not the amount of meals. It's the total food intake over the day. What's your views on trying to build muscle on a calorie deficit? You can absolutely build muscle on a calorie deficit. Now, the thing is, it's not a huge calorie deficit. Like, it's not like, okay, I'm going to starve myself, eat a thousand calories a day and try and build muscle. No, it's not going to be like that. But you can have a slight calorie deficit while still building lean muscle, right? Prime example, I just mentioned my, my coaching student, Graham. He lost three inches off his waist and gained two inches on his arms by following the program. So it's like a body recomposition. He was building muscle while simultaneously burning body fat. Absolutely, you can do it with a properly structured program. The only time you're going to see people who can't do that is when, when you're looking at people who are close to their genetic limits, who are pushing the envelope of what's possible. Like a pro bodybuilder getting ready for competition. Like they will have phases of off season and phases of pre-contest because you're not going to get big and shredded following the same plan. And in fact, when, when we say gain muscle and, and lose body fat, chances are you're, you're actually probably going to lose weight in the process or at, at best maintain your weight. Like you're not going to see people gain weight and get leaner at the same time. It's it's just not going to happen. So, because it's it's easier to lose body fat than it is to gain muscle. Like it's it's easier for someone to lose twenty pounds of body fat than it is to gain twenty pounds of lean solid muscle. So when I say yes, you lose body fat and build muscle, I'm saying okay, you might lose ten pounds of body fat while simultaneously gaining one pound of lean muscle on your frame. Overall, the, there would be a net deficit of a nine pounds on, on your frame in that example. So you're, you can still make progress, but the fat loss is going to be greater than the muscle gain, right? And even in, in Graham's case, I'm, I'm going back to him because he's top of mind, you know, recent coaching student success story. He lost three inches off his waist while gaining two inches on his upper body, right? So there was more fat loss than there was muscle gain, but he still did both. All right, David is joining us. Uh, hello, Lee. Always got brilliant advice. Best bodybuilding channel on YouTube, mate. Just saying thanks for the vids. I appreciate that, David. It means a lot. I mean, uh, I don't know if I'm the best bodybuilding channel, but again, I, I do appreciate the support. I, I try my best, put it that way, right? But I know there's a lot of people out there who have good quality channels, good quality content. I just kind of put my own spin on it. But again, I, I appreciate the support. Glad you enjoy it. Uh, Roshan is joining us. Raymond is joining us. What are your thoughts on water fast? Do we really lose weight fast doing it? Is it safe? Water fasts, they... I've done a water fast before, more, more or less to satisfy my own curiosity, but it, it's not a lifestyle approach, right? Like, if you want to do it for personal reasons, go ahead. But don't think of it as like a long-term fat loss solution. In order to lose fat long-term, what you need to do is instead of thinking of like, what diet do I need to go on? What do I need to cut out? Or, or like, instead of thinking of, of losing, like, how, how, how can I rephrase this? I mean, you need to fix what's wrong. All right. I'll give you the analogy. Let's pretend we're, we're, we've got a boat right? We're, we're out in the sea and we're sitting in our boat and there's a hole in our boat and the boat's taking on water. And you say, well, what's the best bucket that I can use to, to bail out this boat with, right? I can use a small bucket or I can use a big bucket or I can use a round bucket or I can use a shovel or I can, how can I bail out the water that's coming into my boat? And then you, 
this is this is the approach like people think of like dieting there it's like thinking of what bucket i'm going to use to bail out the water how about we plug the hole first fix the the hole fix what's causing you to take on water to begin with and then we'll worry about uh, bailing it out afterwards so like a lot of people are going on what's the best diet what's the best supplement what's the best cardio what's the best to lose weight when they haven't fixed their habits that are causing them to get fat in the first place. Fix those habits first, and, and your weight problems more often than not take care of themselves. If you stop doing the shit that's causing you to get fat in the first place, you're probably not going to be fat. And, and it's like the analogy of the, the, the hole in the boat, right? Everyone's worrying about how do I bail out the boat, bail out the boat, bail out the boat. Why don't you fix the hole first? Fix the hole, then the water's going to stop coming into the boat. Right. So that, that's my approach when it comes to fat loss. Instead of thinking of how can I lose it as fast as possible? How can we prevent you from gaining it in the first place? Once we have that corrected, then we can worry about losing what you have on your frame. And in fact, it kind of goes simultaneously hand in hand. If, if you fix the problem that's causing you to gain the fat in the first place, that is usually the same thing that's going to cause you to lose it over the long term as well. Hopefully that made sense. How are we doing? We've gone for over an hour, so I'm going to have to clue it up very shortly because um, I've, I've got dinner plans tonight, so I, I, can't, I can't be late. All right, and we're, we're meeting my my father. We're, we're going out to a restaurant tonight, so uh, I, don't, I don't want to miss that. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Do you have any tips to how to utilize intermittent fasting? Is it worth utilizing? Intermittent fasting is a tool that you can use. Uh, I, I have mixed opinions on intermittent fasting. I have used it successfully, and I've also found that I've hit a plateau with it. Uh, I'll, that's actually seeing we're on the whole topic of fat loss, and we're starting the five-day lose-your-gut challenge. This will probably be a good question to finish off the video chat on. I know there's a shit ton of questions coming through, and I appreciate all the support, but honestly, I'm just not going to be able to answer them all tonight. Uh, but I will answer this one. Intermittent fasting. I followed this back when I started my most recent fat loss transformation. Those of you who've been following along with me, you know, like back around, well, my son was born in September 2016. Even leading up to then, I've been letting myself go slowly. But a couple of years ago, I hit I hit a low point where I like a, the weight was gradually piling on until the point where I got the where I got to the point where I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize the, the fat slob looking back at me, right? You know, like a lot of people can get to that point. Like it happens so slowly, right? You pile on the weight little bit by little bit. And it's not like you're purposely trying to get fat. It's just you're making poor choices and those poor choices add up over the long term, right? Like the little choices like, oh man, I'm too tired to cook tonight. I'll just order a pizza. I'll get back on track tomorrow. Or you know, I really should go to the gym, but man, I worked late. And I'm tired. I think I'm just going to watch Netflix. You know, I'm going to watch Netflix tonight. I'll go to the gym tomorrow. Those little decisions of I'll do it tomorrow, you know, you do that enough and guess what, right? You, you, you start to get fat and out of shape. And that's where most people, that's how it happens for most people. Like, you know what you should do. It's just you're not doing it. And that was me because once I stopped competing in bodybuilding, I didn't have the motivation to continue cutting and dieting and going to all because i had the all or nothing approach like i was either dieting or i wasn't right it was either chicken and broccoli and two hours of cardio a day or it was bulking you know, and when i say bulking sometimes that wasn't clean bulking that was just like shoveling everything in like as long as i got my protein i didn't care about the rest right i mean i'd make sure i got my you know 200 plus grams of protein, but then the rest could come from, it didn't matter if it was oatmeal or potatoes or pizza or burgers, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I was cutting or bulking. There was no in-between. And you need to master the in-between if you want to make this a lifestyle, right? Get away from the extremes, focus on healthy lifestyle habits. But anyway, um, getting back to my question about intermittent, or the question about intermittent fasting. This was a strategy that I decided to try. And the thing that I liked the most about it is just the convenience factor. Like if you follow intermittent fasting, you don't need to be worrying about meal prep all day long, right? You just eat, you know, whatever, a couple meals later in the day. And it's, it's so convenient because what I would do is I'd get up, I'd drink water, I'd have coffee, 
you know, throughout the day, that was enough to curb my appetite. I'd stay busy doing my work and chores and tasks throughout the day. And then in the evening, I would have dinner with the family and then probably, you know, a couple other snacks or something and go to bed and start the day all over again. So all day long, I didn't have to worry about food, eat heartily in the evening. And I found that worked for me. It actually did because I, I, I lost a significant amount of weight and it was super convenient. And I actually got into the rhythm of it and I really enjoyed it. The problem that I, I found was happening is when I, when I first started it, I, my appetite, I could control it. But the problem that I started to fall into was I would go all day without eating. And then, of course, the leaner you get, the hungrier you get as well. Like the leaner you are, the faster your metabolism races. So that's why you sometimes see people who are lean, like competitive bodybuilders who are, who are super lean or athletes who are super lean and they eat a lot of food and they stay lean is because the leaner you are, it elevates your metabolism and it improves your insulin sensitivity. All the metabolic hormones are functioning at their best. And you're actually like a, like a high performance sports car. Like you are burning calories, right? When you're lean, when you're fat, you, you, your bodies can resort to that fat that's stored there. So you're not feeling as hungry because there's always a steady supply of body fat to be used as well. So the leaner you get, the less fat you have on your body, the hungrier you get as well. And what I also found with the intermittent fasting is all day long, not eating, not eating, not eating. Like as long as I didn't eat and spike my appetite, I could get through it, right? I, I could tide myself over and, and go all day long without eating. But then as soon as I started to eat, and spiked my appetite, you know, with the first bite of food, then I, I couldn't control it. And I had to eat bigger and bigger portions to get satisfied. So what ended up happening is what was at one time a calorie deficit from me eating till I was comfortably full. Then it, it was no longer a deficit. I was eating so much that I was basically getting my full day of calories in that short feeding window. And I, I found it very hard to control my appetite. Like once I started eating, I did not want to stop. Like I would eat enormous amounts of food and still be hungry. So I, after a while, I mean, I, I continued that for like a better part of a year, probably even longer than a year. And I was kind of like maintaining my weight. Like I lost a bit, but then I was like stuck in a plateau where I'm not really making any progress, but I still stuck with it because first off, I enjoyed the convenience of it. But then once I started eating, like I was just eating ridiculous amounts of food every evening. And I, I really felt like sluggish and bloated because I was just eating so much. Now, granted, it was still healthy food, like a lot of protein and vegetables and, and clean carbohydrates and that. But just the, the, the volume was was ridiculous, like big, massive salad to start with, like big, like steak and maybe have a protein shake and then i was like having like fruit and yogurt for dessert and like just just a lot of food volume like the, the my my wife used to get mad at me and say lee like why are you going back to the kitchen for more food like i just she said haven't you had enough and i'm like i'm still hungry so what i ended up doing is i said you know i'm going to go back to a more of a traditional bodybuilding style diet where i'm eating frequently throughout the day probably like four to five meals spaced out throughout the day and by doing that, first off, it, it spiked my metabolism. Just by eating more frequently throughout the day, I, I seen another spike where I actually started to get leaner. I found that it helped to control my blood sugar. So I wasn't going like low blood sugar all day long and then having this massive appetite in the evening. I was more stable throughout the day. So then in the evening, I didn't feel as hungry. So I, I didn't need to eat as much to hit my satiation point. So I actually found it, it was better. So, and that's what I do right now. So like I purposely eat consistently throughout the day and I find that it works much better for me. Now, there are still times when I will incorporate intermittent fasting as a tool to help control my, my body fat. Like, and when I will use it is when I'm traveling, because if you're traveling and you're eating out in restaurants and you don't have control over your diet as much. Like you always have control over your diet. Like even if you're eating out in a restaurant, like you can choose to order, you know, a chicken salad and baked potato, or you know, uh, you know, French fries and and you know, deep fried whatever. Right? Like you have choices still, but you're not in as much control over what you eat when you're eating out in restaurants as you do when you're home. So what I'll do is when I'm traveling, uh, I will utilize that strategy. So I'll probably skip breakfast. Uh, maybe have a light lunch and then have dinner 
and then you know a, a snack before bed, something like that. And I find that just that condensing the amount of meals that I eat allows me to still stay in a calorie deficit uh, or, or at, at most calorie maintenance and maintain my weight when I'm traveling. Whereas most people, when they travel, they end up letting their diet go to crap and they end up eating too much and gaining fat. So I actually made a video about this uh, a while back. It was part of the, the playlist series that I made, my 30-day shred, which I, I set a goal to try and lose 10 pounds in 30 days, which I did not achieve, by the way. It took longer than that, but I documented it through a playlist. And in that one, I covered um, one of those videos was how to stay lean while traveling. And I explained the whole strategy of how I use intermittent fasting when I'm traveling. So it's still a tool that I will go and utilize on occasion, but it's not my main mainstream diet anymore because I find that if I follow intermittent fasting over the prolonged period of time, it throws my appetite out of whack. All right, I'll go all day without eating and then I just have this crazy ferocious appetite in the evenings and it's hard for me to control it. I find it much easier to control my appetite if I eat frequently throughout the day. And I also find my energy levels are stable. Like I, I, I tend to have a better workout if I have some food in my system beforehand. Uh, so that's why I like to eat breakfast. And I, I've tried, like you can do both. Like I've, I've done fasted workouts, still made progress. I'm not saying you can't do it. But overall, at the stage I'm at right now, I find that I will have a better workout if I eat a couple hours before going to the gym. So that's why I like to uh, have more consistent eating throughout the day at this stage of the game. But I have utilized intermittent fasting with success. It's, it, 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 this is actually brings up a good point because when it comes to all these different eating strategies, all these different workout programs, it's not like there's one magic program that works for everybody. You have to find what works for you at your situation, your lifestyle, your fitness level, your body fat level, like what works for you right now at this stage of the game. Because if, if you're following just general fitness influencers on social media and YouTube, like you might have one guy, he's a competitive bodybuilder who's cutting for a show and he's saying, do this. Well, that's probably good for him at that stage, dieting for a show at his level. But if you're 300 pounds overweight, like it's, you don't need to follow the pre-contest bodybuilder diet, right? Like you, you need to follow what's appropriate for you at your stage of the game. It's, it makes sense. Like this stuff makes so much sense when we look at it in context of things outside of fitness. But once you put it in the fitness context, everybody just screws it up and blows things out of proportion. Like let's say education. Are you going to put the same curriculum to a student in kindergarten as you would a college student? Like, are you going to say, hey, you know, five-year-old kindergarten student, you need to learn algebra and calculus and you need to go to biology class and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I don't know my ABCs, right? I don't know how to put one and one together and make two. Like, you know, I, I barely can count to 10. So, like, the, would you give the same course curriculum to, you know, a fourth-year college student as you would to a kindergarten student? No, of course not. But yet we have this stuff in fitness where someone is brand new, overweight, out of shape, and then they're following pre-contest bodybuilder diet. Like, no, <laughs> you don't do that. Right? You have to follow a program that's appropriate for you at your level. And we're all at different levels. So that's where the confusion comes in because what's right for one person may not be right for another, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. So like some people say, oh, I'm following a low carb cutting diet. That might be right for them at their stage where they're too, but it's not right for everybody. So that's where the whole customization comes into play. You have to find what's right for you and your level at this stage of the game right now, right? That's where it gets confusing. It's not like this is right or that's wrong or this guy's full of shit and that guy is not full of shit or anything. It's, it's making the plan fit you and your lifestyle at the stage you're at right now. And hopefully that analogy of, you know, trying to give a kindergarten student, a, a college student's curriculum or vice versa. Like you wouldn't imagine a professor in college comes in. Okay, guys, uh, today we're going to uh, learn the alphabet. And everybody like, what the hell are you talking about? Right? Or maybe he says, you know, you, you go into college in math class and he, you know, he, he gets you. All right, everybody, today your task is to count to 10. Right? One, two, three. People be like, this guy's nuts because he's providing you a different program or a different curriculum that's not suited to you and your situation. Right? It's not that it's right or wrong. It's just 
the wrong person is getting it. So with that being said, I'm going to clue it up, guys. There's folks are out there waiting for me now. We have to head off now to uh, our dinner reservations. Hopefully you found this video chat helpful. The replay will be posted up within the next 24 hours. And if you are registered for the five-day Lose Your Gut Challenge, keep an eye on our private Facebook group. It's the Lose Your Gut Challenge. You would have gotten a, a direct message from me. You've been welcomed into the challenge by now. And I'm looking forward to following along with your progress and helping you to master your metabolism and cut out the crap and learn how fitness and nutrition works and coming up with a realistic action plan for you and your situation right now. So uh, again, I'm looking forward to that. Have yourself a fantastic weekend. Have yourself a fantastic Remembrance Day as well. Like, let's pay respects to our veterans out there. I should have my poppy on, actually. I know it's on my jacket there, but I should have one on my sh shirt for Remembrance Day. But with that being said, have yourself a great one. Over and out.